we have managed to get to this part, hopefully without highly annoying all of you. The problem is that this part annoys even us. From 33 minutes past midnight, when the power rise from around 30 megawatts was initiated, to 1.2340, when the pressing of the AZ-5 shutdown button sealed the Chernobyl Unit 4 RBMK reactor's fate, there is a bunch of stuff that needs to be spoken of carefully. We can't do that by continuing to follow the HBO miniseries Episode 5 script sequentially, unless we want an average view duration of 7 minutes on this video. The script is too scattered and just plain dumb, and we're going to go on too deeply on too many tangents, boring everyone. So we're going to start backwards and jump around. The episode 5 script shows a power surge prior to the pressing of the AZ-5 button. In fact, what was shown on TV goes even further than the script. Before a shocked Dyatlov utters, what did you? Power is shown as having reached 1000 megawatts and rapidly growing. This is the look what Dyatlov did dunder version of the disaster where the conditions he created in what must have been an egregious series of violations of the operating instructions caused a runaway reaction necessitating an emergency AZ-5 shutdown. The problem is the creative geniuses at HBO and Sky once again failed to look at a timeline of events. In case you're wondering if it takes an actual genius to confer with a timeline, this is the INSAG-7 report that serves as the top source on the causes of Chernobyl. And this is all of the three pages that contain a timeline formatted as a timeline. At 1.2340 or 1.2339, the AZ-5 button is pressed. At 1.2343, power exceeded 530 megawatts thermal. Even in Grigory Medvedev's Chernobyl notebook, it is written that in three seconds following the pressing of the button, the reactor's power exceeded 530 megawatts. How does the HBO episode 5 script show reactor power reaching 500 megawatts and the TV episode 1000 megawatts before the pressing of the button? According to the average, undoubtedly bright viewer, it's just dramatization to make things obvious for the average viewers who are notoriously stupid. The problem is the situation goes further. A lot further. In the 1986 INSAG-1 timeline, this being the initial report that resulted from the Vienna meeting, where Comrade Legasov was forgetting more lies than the participants in the miniseries know, it is stated that at 1.23.4, in other words, at the very beginning of the test, if the operators had allowed the reactor to shut itself down automatically, nothing would have happened. Except on page 11 of INSAG-7, as the timing of the disabling of this automatic trip is corrected, it is stated, in the light of new information regarding positive SCRAM, the statement made under the significance column of Table 1 in INSAG-1 that this trip would have saved the reactor seems not to be valid. Or, in other words, from page 18, disabling of the two-turbine trip was allowed, and indeed was required by normal procedures at low power levels, such as the power level for the revised test. In any event, the occurrence of this trip might well have caused the destruction of the reactor at the time of the turbine trip, rather than shortly afterwards. So, Chernobyl would have likely happened even if the reactor was shut down at the beginning of the test. In other words, the test itself didn't actually matter. Let's observe what Annex 1 of INSAG-7 writes on pages 65 to 66. Implementation of the test program. The tests, which started at 1.2304, caused the following processes in the reactor. The rotational speed and delivery of the MCPs powered from turbo generator number 8, which was being run down, MCPs numbers 13, 14, 23 and 24, were reduced. Delivery of the other MCPs, MCPs number 11, 12, 21 and 22, was slightly increased. The total coolant flow rate began to fall. 
35 seconds after the start of the transient, it had fallen by 10 to 15% of the initial value. So, half of the main circulation pumps were directly involved in the rundown. The coolant flow from them was consequently reduced. However, the other half of the main circulation pumps actually had their delivery of coolant slightly increased. Furthermore, because all eight main circulation pumps rather than the usual six were connected to the core for the test, there was actually plenty of coolant, as was intended. Of the initial high coolant flow rate by the time the AZ5 button was pressed, there was a reduction of only 10 to 15%. Contrast this description with some of the statements HBO Legasov makes. The test begins, the pumps are shut down. He removes the water placard. The pumps stop moving water through the reactor. The uranium fuel is now unchecked by fresh coolant. Inside the core, the remaining water is quickly converting to steam. A void is being created. There is no fresh water to replace it. Yeah, no. We're going back to pages 65 and 66 of Insag 7 to resume our reading. The reduction in coolant flow rate led to a corresponding increase in steam quality in the core, which was to some small extent offset by the increase in pressure following the closure of the emergency stop valves of turbo generator number 8. This stage of the process has been mathematically modelled by experts in the USSR and in the USA. The theoretical predictions of the integral parameters agree well with the values actually recorded. Both calculations show that the released void reactivity was negligible and could have been compensated for by the insertion for a short distance, up to 1.4 meters, of the EPS rods into the core. During the rundown of turbo generator number 8, there was no increase in the reactor power. This is confirmed by the DREG program, which from 119.39 until 119.44, and from 119.57 until 123.30, i.e. prior and for a substantial period during the test, recorded one overcompensation upward signals, at which time the automatic control rods could not move into the core. Their positions, recorded for the last time at 122.37, were 1.4, 1.6 and 0.2 meters for automatic regulators numbers 1, 2 and 3, respectively. Thus, neither the reactor power nor the other parameters, pressure and water level in the steam separator drums, coolant and feed water flow rates, etc., required any intervention by the personnel or by the engineered safety features from the beginning of the tests until the EPS5 button was pressed. The commission did not detect any events or dynamic processes, such as hidden reactor runaway, which could have been the event which initiated the accident. The commission identified a rather extended initial reactor state, during which, if positive reactivity had occurred for any reason, there could have been a power excursion under conditions in which the reactor's EPS would be unable to perform its functions. This description is not without its problems. Soviet and American expert calculations showed that the released void reactivity was negligible, yet apparently it needed some compensation tantamount to up to 1.4 meters of insertion of the emergency protection system rods into the core, which is actually how the core ended up exploding, although it's unclear the number of rods this is a reference to. The statement that during the rundown there was no increase in the reactor power is also rather bizarre. From other sources, it appears there was an increase from 30 to 60 megawatts. The lack of movement on the part of the automatic control rods meant to compensate for this sort of thing ties into another big but relatively unknown controversy, which we will dive into shortly. Finally, in the last sentence, there is a hypothetical if positive reactivity had occurred for any reason. The emergency protection system might have had to be used, which rather than being unable to perform its functions, told the other source of positive reactivity to 
to hold its beer. The circumstances in which the AZ-5 button was pressed is one of the mysteries of Chernobyl. The control room was actually full of people, of which we did a video. Yet we don't have anything conclusive coming out of it. Certainly, a lot was made up about the atmosphere in the control room, some of which we'll address later. The ultimate point is, however, that the circumstances of the disaster were not only coloured by hindsight, but intentionally manipulated. The significance of the test was greatly exaggerated, whereas what the international section of INSAC-7 describes as the scram just before the sharp rise in power that destroyed the reactor may well have been the decisive contributory factor, was clearly attempted to be concealed. Before disclosing the positive scram effect, Soviet experts kept attempting to make it seem like the operators should have shut down the reactor earlier, thereby saving it. This was not only false at the beginning of the test at 1.2304, but also at the infamous printout at 1.2230. The situation surrounding this printout is such a clusterfuck that we did an entire over 40 minute video on it. Let's try to do a quick recap of the actual circumstances. Here is episode 5's portrayal of the purported printout. Toptonov stands by a large dot matrix printer, as it slowly ejects a sheet of data. Legasov, voiceover. 1.22 and 30 seconds. Toptonov sees a report from the reactor's Scala computer system. Based on the absence of sufficient control rods, the computer is recommending the reactor be shut down. Toptonov hands the printout to Akimov, who reads it, frets, then hands it to Dyatlov. Dyatlov doesn't take it, just looks at it. Barely. Dyatlov. Of course it's saying that. It doesn't know we're running a test. Oddly cheerful. All right, boys, another few minutes and it will all be over. The focus of the printout is the operating reactivity margin, the number that represents control rods in the core. According to the international section of INSAG-7, the operators did not have it. Annex 1 of INSAG-7 fills in some pretty interesting details. While there was a record of some sort, whatever, magnetic tape, it's supposed to be... Of the reactor parameters, there was no operating calculations performed at this time. These calculations were done after the disaster at a different nuclear power plant altogether. Neither the control room personnel nor the Scala system personnel had the ORM number at 1.2230, and there is no mention anywhere of a computer recommendation to shut the reactor down on account of the ORM which would have just blown up the reactor about a minute earlier. Also notice how control room personnel and Scala computer system personnel are mentioned separately. That's because the computer and instrumentation used to determine the reactivity margin for the RBMK-1000 reactor were located approximately 50 meters from the control room console. Make note of the period of time for an ORM calculation to be made. Deputy Chief Engineer Anatoly Dyatlov points out that even if an ORM calculation existed, the time it would have taken to get the printout from the Scala computer system location to the reactor control room would have exceeded the time it took for the AZ-5 button to be pressed around 70 seconds later. Remarkably, and of great significance, the malarkey doesn't stop there. The printout that wasn't in the control room with the calculation that wasn't on it was hardly valid to begin with. The purple line is the feed water flow rate. Notice how dramatically it goes up at 119 and how it comes down a few minutes later. Feed water was at a much cooler temperature than the coolant coming out of the reactor core it mixed with and subcooled. If the feed water flow goes up, the mixture is reduced in temperature and as it circles around and goes through the core, voiding or steam is reduced. If the feed water flow goes down, the mixture has a higher temperature, and consequently voiding increases as it loops around and goes through the core. Due to the positive void coefficient, and indeed the positive power coefficient of reactivity, control rods would be moving in and out 
to balance the more or less voiding. In other words, if the feed water flow increases significantly, control rods move up to compensate for there being less voiding, and if the feed water flow decreases significantly, control rods move down to compensate for there being more voiding. So looking at the change in feed water flow, we would surmise that control rods moved out subsequent to the increase in feed water flow, beginning at 119, and then control rods moved back in subsequent to the decrease in feed water flow beginning in the latter half of 121. The timeline of the 1986 INSAG-1 report matches this expectation. At 119, a reduction in feed water flow is initiated, which will result in less voiding or steam in the core. At 119.30, the feed water flow is quite high. Voiding is reduced in the core meaning more water provides negative reactivity, which is compensated by the withdrawal of both automatic and manual control rods. This means the operating reactivity margin was falling at around 119.30. At 121.50, a heavy reduction in the feed water flow is initiated. 20 seconds later, the timeline claims automatic control rods start driving in to compensate for the positive reactivity of warmer water experiencing more voiding reaching the core inlet. As this is 1986 in SAG-1, the myth of the computer printout showing operators that the ORM was half the permissible value exists at 122.30. But more notably, there is a statement that compensatory control rod movement was completed. Or so it seems. Look at the so-called abrupt reduction of the purple feed water flow rate line. Relative to getting an accurate reading of a complete compensatory control rod insertion, the reduction of the feed water flow was anything but abrupt. In fact, the reduction of the feed water flow doesn't even seem complete itself by 122.30. In the other video, we included two sources of commentary on the validity of how current any data was with respect to ORM or control rod movement at 122.30. Both sources were ultimately of the opinion a non-existent calculation of the ORM would be inaccurate. There was apparently a 30 second or greater transit time of water through the coolant loop following a reduction of the feed water flow rate. Control rods will have to have moved in in response. Finally, the computer system would have to be fast and reliable enough to capture and show the result of this process at the time of the 12230 printout. It is apparently possible that any 12230 printout missed most, if not the entire process, that had begun 40 to 50 seconds prior. Consequently, any such printout would have missed control rod insertion, or in other words, an increase in the operating reactivity margin. And that's not even the end of it. The INSAG-1 timeline shows further insertion of automatic control rods in response to changing coolant conditions slash more voiding during the turbine rundown test. Soviet experts provided a simulation to their international counterparts showing, among other things, movement of the three automatic rod groups, each comprised of four rods. The automatic rod groups are represented by purple line E, black line G, and pink line H. This simulation shows automatic control rod insertion beginning at 122.10 in response to the initiation of reduction of cooler feed water flow that caused greater voiding. By the beginning of the test at 123.04, groups E and H have experienced substantial insertion. Over the course of the test, you can see both groups experiencing further insertion, and group G inserting starting at 123.32. Between 122 and 123.40, this simulation clearly shows 12 automatic rods inserting to compensate for great avoiding in the core. Such an unaccounted for insertion would have a substantial effect on the ORM from a low of 6 to 8 rods to the minimum allowable of 15. 
In other words, by the time the operators pressed the AZ5 button at 1.2340, which is when the ORM actually mattered, the reactor would have still exploded whether the button was pressed at 1.2230 or 1.2304, due to the extent of extraction of control rods, they may even not have been in violation, or in relatively small violation, of the operating instructions. Remember when we spoke of VP Volkov, the head of the IV Kachatov Institute Research Group on the reliability and safety of nuclear power plants with RBMK reactors, that we identified three essential causes of the Chernobyl disaster. The positive power coefficient of reactivity, the positive scram effect, and the formulation of incorrect operating procedures. Here is one indication of the operating procedures themselves being incorrect. The lower ORM limit of 15 rods was no guarantee of safety. There is a noteworthy contradiction at the bottom of page 65 of Annex 1 of INSAG 7. It claims there was no increase in reactor power, and for evidence of that it points to a signal that apparently indicated automatic control rods could not move into the core from 11957 until 12330. One of the problems with this is that in the paragraph right above this one, a supposedly negligible void reactivity released during a test would have still taken the insertion of more rods up to a length of 1.4 meters, presumably without a positive scram effect. Something is certainly not adding up. This signal does appear on the 1986 simulation too, and yet the automatic control rods are simulated as moving in. Were manual control rods used instead? We don't know. If you look at the timeline found in INSAG 7, not only the movement of control rods, but even the substantial changes in feedwater flow between 119 and 12230 are gone. We are inclined to believe there is some funny business going on here. We have previously talked about how, with the refutation of other allegations of operating violations, INSAG 7 shockingly tries to add weight onto the ORM. Of course the HBO episode 5 script takes misrepresenting the ORM to a whole nother level. Legasov says they begin pulling control rods out, dozens at a time, halfway out, three quarters of the way out, and the power still does not budge. So they begin to pull them all the way out. There were 211 control rods in Reactor 4. Akimov and Toptonov completely withdrew 205. Basically, according to this statement, the reactor was functioning with many dozens, if not over 100 fully inserted control rods, that the operators fully extracted to raise the power to 200 megawatts. There is no mention of what the limit for extracting control rods was, just the implication that having extracted 205 out of 211 was preposterous. Aside from six remaining rods, being the lowest and most inaccurate figure available, nowhere is it mentioned or implied that the lower limit was only 15 rods remaining. So, you could have 196 out of 211 control rods extracted, and be compliant with the operating instructions. Furthermore, a typical range of operation was from 26 to 35 rods, or the vast majority of rods in terms of reactivity worth being extracted. Why? There is this tendency people have to convey their misunderstanding of Chernobyl in the form of car and driving analogies. Maybe the director of the Kachatov Institute of Atomic Energy, Anatoly Alexandrov, started it when he tried blaming the driver. Let's indulge ourselves too. When you're driving a car, do you do it with a foot stepping down on the brakes pedal? You don't. Well, it turns out, generally speaking, you don't operate nuclear reactors that way either. According to page 72 of INSAG 7, in fact, post-accident calculation studies have shown that full withdrawal of the manual control rods from the core, which is not prohibited in other reactors, such as WWER reactors, 
was unacceptable for the RDMK reactor, owing to the design of the manual control rods. Withdrawal of more than a certain number of RCPS rods from the core resulted in the concentration of too much positive reactivity in the lower part of the core in terms of displaceable water columns. In terms of having to have control rods in them, RBMK reactor cores were the exception, and even they did not have to have, and did not have many. But there was a lower limit of 15 rods, after all. When the night shift took over at midnight, the operating reactivity margin was 24 rods. Obviously, operators weren't pulling dozens of control rods out from completely inserted to completely extracted, as the HBO script suggests. But what exactly was going on? More importantly, what did the operators know? In the previous video, we established that there is a strong possibility no violation was committed in deciding to raise the power after its drop. Nonetheless, as power was being raised and held in order to be compliant with operating instructions, an ORM of at least 15 needed to be maintained. In order for that to have happened, the operators would have needed to know what the ORM value was. According to the book Chernobyl Past, Present and Future, even the Soviet government commission that blamed the operators recognised the absence of a device in the reactor plant design indicating an operative reactivity margin, and warning on the approach to a dangerous limit. Yet operators report not being entirely in the dark. Nikolai Karpan, in his book Revenge of the Peaceful Atom, has a chapter on answers to the questions that have arisen. The ORM figures prominently. Karpan is quoting a couple of familiar figures to us from the actual trial. Anatoly Dyatlov and Yuri Tregov. Tregub, and when we raise the power to 200 megawatts, I return to the SIUT control panel. When I looked at the distribution field for the last time before the accident, the SIUR had pulled out about half of the rods close to the limit switches, and the rest were about 2 meters away. The last value I saw was that 19.5 rods were in the active zone. Dyatlov, somewhere around 1 a.m., I asked Toptonov what the reactivity margin was, and received the answer 19 or 18 rods. I don't remember exactly. On the digital display, Tregub also saw 17 or 18, i.e. Toptonov looked periodically. Grigory Medvedev himself in his Chernobyl notebook that the HBO episode 5 script relies on refers to senior reactor control engineer Leonid Toptonov seeing an ORM of over 15. Prepare to be blown away here. We control plus F, type in 18, and let's look at some results. According to the USSR report to the IAEA, the reactivity margin was 6 to 8 rods. According to the statement of the dying Toptonov, who looked at the printout from the Scala computer 7 minutes before the explosion, it was 18 rods. There is no contradiction here. The report was written on the basis of material delivered from the unit where the accident had occurred, and something could have been lost. It was impossible to raise the power further. The reactivity margin was considerably less than called for by the rules, and as I have already said above, in the words of SIUR Toptonov, it consisted of 18 rods. That count was given by the Scala computer seven minutes before the AZ, emergency safety button, was pressed. At 1.22.30 hours, 1.5 minutes before the explosion, SIUR Leonid Toptonov saw from a printout of the program for fast estimation of the reactivity margin that it represented a value demanding that the reactor be shut down immediately. That is, those same 18 rods instead of the necessary 28. For a time, he hesitated. After all, there were cases when the computer was wrong. Nevertheless, Toptonov reported the situation to Akimov and Dyatlov. Akimov made his report. He enumerated in detail the sequence of the procedures performed before the explosion. We did everything correctly, Nikolai Maximovich. 
I have no complaints against the personnel on the shift. At the moment when the AZ-5 button was pressed, the reactivity margin was 18 rods of the safety system. Testimony of VG Smaggy, who took over the shift from Akimov. I stopped in the ward where Leonard Optonov was. He was lying there, all reddish brown. His mouth and lips were very swollen. So was his tongue. It was difficult for him to speak. One thing was torturing everyone. Why had it exploded? I asked him about the reactivity margin. Speaking with difficulty, he said that Scala showed 18 rods. But it could have been wrong. The computer was sometimes wrong. Grigory Medvedev, certifiable moron that he was, apparently believed that the lower limit of the ORM according to operating instructions was 28. So when he wrote about the apparent actual claims of the operators, rather than their made-up dialogue, that what they had available to them indicated the ORM was 18, he thought this was a value in violation of the operating instructions. He even quotes Akimov as claiming, we did everything correctly. Medvedev claims that the dying unit shift leader Alexander Akimov and the dying senior reactor control engineer Leonid Toptonov believed the ORM was 18. Medvedev then involves the following shift leader Smagin, visiting the operators in hospital, claiming that Toptonov told him Scala showed 18 rods. We know that there was no Scala printout at 122.30 with an ORM calculation. Medvedev seems to refer to a printout from minutes earlier. Do we know anything about this printout, you ask? Well, as it turns out, we do. On page 11 of Insight 7, we find the following statement. The recent reports confirm that the minimum ORM was indeed violated by 1am on 26th of April. Yet again, Insight 7 is missing something quite important. Nikolai Karpan provides the following. From the story of witness V.F. Verkovod, SDIVT, recorded by A. Kolyadin. This person worked in the Scala computer room. He said the following. I personally made the printout of the Prisma for the SIUR, SIUB and SIUT myself and took it to the control room somewhere at 1am. Well, maybe at 1.05am. In any case, until 1.10am. Because I had to make the Prisma printout every two hours, on odd hours. That night, I made a printout at 1am. I had to make the next one at 3am. So there was a computer printout available to the operators including an ORM figure. But it wasn't at 1.22.30. A person brought it to the control room. This actual printout is mentioned in none of the major public reports we have seen. Take a guess as to why. Karpan quotes Dyatlov. I assert that on 260486, no one saw a reactivity margin of less than 15 rods. And then proceeds to write in reference to this printout, author's note, so no later than 1 hour 10 minutes, i.e. 12 minutes before the start of the test. The value of the ORM was known to the control room personnel and the head of the program. According to the testimony at the trial of Dyatlov, AS and other witnesses, NS, NSS Rogoshkin and Tregob UU, the reactivity margin was no less than 17 RR. The calculation of the ORM performed in the report gave a value close to 17. Then Karpan points out, according to background knowledge known to the operators, the ORM could not have declined into violation based on xenon poisoning. This is something significant as we keep encountering it in our reading. Whether it's Dyatlov, Karpan or later operator Fatahov, who appears in the video we mentioned earlier bringing it up, there were contemporaneous sources of information that made the Chernobyl operators better aware of how xenon poisoning worked in RBMK reactors than most people second-guessing them after the disaster. Their material, in addition to the information available to them in the control room, apparently indicated they were within the allowed margin of ORM. Then Karpan proceeds to write on what we've already gone over. The transient reduction of the ORM due to coolant conditions under 15 
that was reversed by the time the AZ-5 button was pressed. After most of the lies claimed against the operators were refuted in INSAC-7, only the operating reactivity margin, or the number of control rods remaining in the core, was left standing as the pillar of their guilt. Yet even this persistent charge, upon scrutiny, appears grossly manipulated and distorted. <laughs>